A friend of mine told me this story about a girl she met from Sweden who was staying with her as a couch surfer. The girl was in her mid-twenties, and while my friend told me her name I never remembered it, just the content of this horrific story that will never leave my mind. So this girl, let's call her Jane, was driving to her mother's house, they lived far out of the city and in a highly forested area. There were no street lights and not a lot of houses. If there were houses, they were built back into the forest with long winding driveways before any sight of life. So Jane was a late teenager driving back to her mother's home in the late evening. As she was driving something up ahead on the road caught her eye. It was a small bundle next to the road and as her car passed the bundle she was shocked. It looked like a baby wrapped up in a blanket. Jane smashed the brake stopping 50 meters up the road. She revered back a little and then jumped out of the car as quick as she could thinking that someone had abandoned a baby on the road. Jane ran over to the bundled up blanket and exhaled a sigh of relief. It was just a toy baby. Just as she had picked up the baby she saw headlights coming down the road in front of her. Suddenly realizing she was standing on the road alone at night she ran quickly back to her car and jumped in checking on the engine and driving off. The car behind her sped up, coming up really close to the back of her car, tooting its horn at her. Jane was panicking. She started driving faster and faster, constantly checking her review mirror. Although she couldn't who was in the car behind her, she was still terrified. Eventually, she reached her mother's driveway, which was still about two kilometers long. Her mother lived deep into the forest. She thought to herself that if the car followed her down the driveway, she would call her mother and tell her to ring the police. And as she turned onto the driveway, the car behind her also turned into the driveway still very close behind her. I remember part of the story was that she kept thinking back to the baby toy and how creepy the evening had been. Jane got out her phone and called her mother. She told her she was being followed and to call the police. She was expected to arrive in about five minutes. The car was still following very close and both cars were going way too fast for the type of road and for no street lights. Jane could see nothing but what was being lit by her headlights and the headlights of her pursuer. Then she saw her mother's house in the distance of her headlights the pursuers still very close behind her, still beeping the horn so loudly Jane's ears rang. As she got to the house she jumped out of the car. Her mother was standing at the front of the house waiting for her with a kitchen knife in her hand. Jane ran up to her as quickly as she could. The car that was following also stopped and the doors of the car flew open. An elderly couple jumped out of the car and were yelling and pointing to Jane's car. Someone got into your CAR, they screamed. As Jane was realizing what had happened a man jumped out of the back seat of Jane's car and ran into the forest. Everyone just looked at each other in shock as Jane realized what had just happened. The car coming down the road had seen someone jump into her car when she stopped to check the baby. It was most likely they had left it there on the road watching for people to stop, taking advantage of people's kindness. As I said at the start of this post, a friend of mine told me this story and I believe it to be true. If anyone else has heard of this send a comment. I don't believe it was the guy's first time trying this. Always lock your doors when you get out of your car. I had an incident that happened about a year ago that scared the shit out of me. For privacy reasons, the most I can tell you is that it happened in Indiana. This is a legit story. I'm not going to tell you that Bigfoot ran out of the woods and punched out one of my windows. I didn't box an evil leprechaun from another dimension to save my captured girlfriend. I just saw something that really freaked me out and I feel like I have to share this with Reddit. Before I tell you about the incident, I need to explain why my best friend's grandparents' neighborhood has always spooked me. I'll call my buddy Steve. Steve's grandparents lived about 25 minutes out of town. There are probably about 10 houses in the area. Each house is surrounded by ominous looking trees. The jagged branches stick out like they are hands reaching out for you. It's kind of a swampy area with very little lighting around. The lack of lighting makes everything invisible in the woods surrounding the houses. It is literally straight out of a horror movie. 
This would be enough to scare some people, but there have also been some disturbing occurrences. A while ago, there was a man that was tied to a chair in an abandoned house and someone set the house on fire. I was skeptical when Steve told me about it, but even his grandparents told me the same thing. One day while driving to his grandparents' house, he showed me the burned remains of the house. As if that didn't give off enough bad vibes, a lady hung herself in her front yard after sending her kids to school one day. It's just a downright creepy slash sketchy place to drive to at night. Steve had been staying at his grandma's house for about a week because his grandparents were visiting relatives in Arkansas. This provided the perfect chance to drink and basically do what we want. Now that you basically got the backstory, I'll get to what happened. Well, one night Steve texts me and asks if I wanted to come over and hang out. It was late November and a little after 10.30. It was late, but I'm a bit of a night owl, so I didn't mind. I told him to give me a few minutes and I'd head over. Assuming that he is still at his grandma's, I start heading that way. I drive all the way to his grandma's house and realize all of the lights inside the house were off. Confused, I whip out my phone and text Steve. Me, hey you are at your grandma's right? Steve, nope my house. Me, WTF I just drove all the way out here, you could have told me. Steve, sorry man, just hurry up and get over here. I got something I gotta tell you. Steve had been trying to get with a girl he had liked for a long time. He's really bad with talking with the ladies though so he'd been asking me for advice. That had to be what this was all about. I chuckled while shaking my head. Put my car in reverse and called Steve the dumbass under my breath. I began to head back and then my phone rang. It was Steve. I answered it and he began to give me some details about the girl's situation. I stopped at a four-way stop and listened to Steve ramble on and on. I sat there for some time listening to Steve get all pumped up about his recent success. I looked up to finally turn left and saw something. It appeared to be a shadow in the front yard of an old house. I had no clue someone even lived in the house. The shadow was very close to the road. Oh shit, some guy is standing in his front yard looking at me. I laughed. He's probably wondering why the hell I'm just sitting here at the stop sign. My car radio showed that I had been stopped at the stop sign for about five minutes so I could imagine I seemed sketchy. I began to turn my car left. My headlights illuminated the shadow and I became very serious. My headlights revealed an old lady standing there with her hands folded as if she was praying. She was looking down and her mouth was moving quick. I couldn't make out anything she was saying at all. Her mouth was just moving 100 miles an hour and she seemed like she was in a trance. She was probably 5 feet from my car. I sat there and stared. It was probably 10 degrees outside and all that she was wearing was a gray dress. My headlights were directly on her and she didn't even look up. I didn't know what to do exactly. At first I was concerned for the old lady, but the more she stood there, the more the hair stood on the back of my neck. Steve realized I hadn't said anything for a few minutes. Steve, you still there? Me, dude, this old lady is just standing here. Steve, what is she doing? Me, she's just praying right by the road. Steve, what the hell, it's almost midnight, is she okay? Me, I think, I don't know. I really don't want to ask. She looks almost possessed the way she's standing there. I'm afraid if I drive though she might run in front of my car. She's not even looking at me. She's just wearing this dress out here too. I think I'm just going to try to slowly drive past her. She's almost on the road where I have to turn though. I slowly start to attempt to go by her. I hit my brakes slightly afraid that she'd run out in front of me. As I slowly start driving by, she is literally inches from my passenger window. She didn't budge. Her mouth never quit going either. Never even acknowledged me. I still couldn't hear what she was muttering, but I didn't want to roll my window down to find out. Steve spoke into the phone and he seemed worried. Steve, wait, turning? Where are you? 
Me, I'm at the four-way stop right by your grandma. Steve, dude that lady hung herself there. Get the fuck out of there. My stomach sank and I smashed the gas pedal. I drove about 80 till I got close till town. I was so scared that my voice became shaky on the phone. When I arrived at Steve's I told him everything I saw. We were both in disbelief. Suddenly I became very nervous. Every scary movie you ever see usually involves the demon or ghost following the person to their home. I stayed at Steve's house for two nights and nothing happened. I began to dread going to sleep at my house, but when I finally did, everything still was normal as usual. There was one occurrence when Steve had to grab something at his grandma's so I rode with him. On the way back, it looked like there was a lady walking around in a dress, but Steve took no chances and blew past the stop sign so we really couldn't tell. As of now, there is nothing more to add to the story. Whether it was the lady's ghost, a demon, or just some really weird old lady that decided to pray by the road at midnight in 10 degree weather, it scared the shit out of me, hopefully it was the last one. Now I take a different way to Steve's grandma's if I go there at night. Just remember if you guys somehow stumble upon the same neighborhood, don't stop for the old lady. The cashier, an acne riddled kid who looked to be in his late teens or early 20s looked up from shoving the bag of potato chips, two sodas, and a pack of Lucky Strikes into a plastic bag. For a moment, he just stood there, seemingly frozen in mid-action. Then he finally answered, Yeah, what's up, man? I let out a barely perceptible sigh. I'd been half afraid that I would be told to take a long walk off a short pier, to put it politely. Feeling relieved, I reached into my back pocket for what was there. You see, I seem to have, well, sort of gotten lost out here. I decided to take a late night drive and ended up getting turned around on all these two lane back roads I unfolded the map and set it on the counter so he and I could both see it before continuing. So I was hoping you could point out on here roughly where we are. And more importantly, the way to get back to the main road? There was another long stretch of silence and then the kid began to laugh, softly at first and then louder. Dude, a paper map? He managed out between wheezes, are you for real? What year do you think this is, 1993? For my part, I simply let out a resigned sigh. I'd had a bad feeling I would be getting this sort of reaction from someone his age, and it looked like I'd been proven correct. Can't say I didn't see it coming. He wiped tears from the corners of his eyes and looked at me. Seriously bro, don't you have GPS in your car or something? He asked. Immediately, I hooked a thumb over my shoulder, pointing out the glass entry door at the beige sedan sitting at the gas pumps. Not in a Honda Accord from 1979, I replied simply. As he looked behind me out the door, I could see he wanted to make another quip, probably something about how I should buy a newer car or something. Thankfully, though, he kept it to himself. Instead, he leaned over the map, and still chuckling softly to himself, began looking at it. A few moments later, he snapped his fingers. Ha! Ah, I still got it, he said proudly, then pushed his finger down near the middle of the map and looked up at me. We're right about here, roughly six or seven miles outside Placer, I leaned over the counter to see as he drew his finger away. Here? He nodded, and I pulled a pen out of my pocket, circling the area as a reminder once I left, then examined the map further. Okay, so it seems I could take more than a few roads to get back to Interstate 5, right? The kid nodded again, clearly already bored with the unusual interaction by the slightly annoyed look which had begun to cross his face. Sure, he said simply, then placed my bagged items on top of the map. That'll be $14.50 for this, and $28.50 for the gas. I reached into my pocket and pulled my wallet out, withdrawing three twenties and handing them to him. The register let out its trademark ding as it shot open, and he placed the bills in it before pulling out and handing me my change. Placing it and my wallet back into my pocket, I picked up the bag and folded the map back up. Thanks for the help, I said as I turned to head out the door. 
Yeah, no problem I heard him mutter at me as I crossed to the front door and pushed it open. A small bell hung from the inside handle jingled as I stepped outside and let the door swing shut behind me. The sounds of the refrigerator's humming and the fluorescent lights softly buzzing was replaced by those of a summertime forest at night. Crickets and cicadas buzzed loudly in the grass around the store, almost overwhelming the buzzing sound of the lights over the pumps. The sound of an owl hooting loudly echoed through the trees, followed by the loud call of what had to be an elk. I inhaled the clean air before heading down the steps for my car. Pulling open the driver's door, I took one last look around before dropping into the driver's seat. So, did you find out where we are? Asked a voice from the passenger seat. For a split second, a wave of confusion and panic swept over me, and I spun in my seat. It was immediately replaced by a wave of embarrassment, amplified as my friend began to let out a deep laugh. Dude, were you in there that long that you forgot I was out here waiting for you? Not wanting to admit I had done just that, I shook my head. Nah, bro, not that. Just, dealing with the kid in there was a major headache he nodded sympathetically. Craig was one of my close friends. Ever since we'd met each other, we immediately clicked and had stuck with each other from that point on. And one thing we both loved to do was take late night drives to nowhere, simply driving around with no destination in mind, listening to the radio, and occasionally sharing a joint one of us would buy. This is the first time we've ever gotten lost, though. I reached into the bag, pulling out the bottle of Mr. Pibb and handing it to him. Here I said simply, before pulling the lucky strikes out and chucking the rest into the back seat. Pulling the key from my pocket, I slid it into the ignition and turned it, the car's buzzer sounding as the dash lights came on. A moment later, the inline four quietly rumbled to life with its traditional burble. Tearing open the packaging, I pulled a cigarette from the pack and stuck it into the corner of my mouth before reaching to push in the car's cigarette lighter. As I did, I shot a glance back towards the store. And froze. A small shiver shot down my spine as I realized the kid was standing at the door and staring out at us. What the actual hell? Craig caught my gaze and turned to look himself. Dude, what the hell is his problem? I shook my head as the lighter popped back out, signaling it was ready to use. I pushed the glowing red coil against the tip of the smoke for a moment until it was lit, then placed it back in its slot. I pulled it from my lips and exhaled a cloud of smoke before answering, feeling more than a bit unnerved. I don't know, but honestly man, that's more than a bit creepy I shot one last glance. The kid hadn't even blinked once, he was just staring with an off-putting intensity out the glass. Come on, let's get out of here, Craig said, echoing the thoughts swimming through my mind. I put the car into first gear and eased off the clutch, the car beginning to roll forward. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him turn and shoot the bird at the kid as we slid out from under the lights into the dark. Prick, I heard him mumble. I turned the car left and began heading back the way we came. Well, the good thing is, yeah, I did find out where we are. I pulled the map from my pocket and handed it to my friend. I heard him fumbling for a moment, and then a small flashlight clicked on as he aimed it at the map. Dude, how did we make it almost as far east as Placer? He asked with a slightly astonished tone. Longer drive than normal, I guess I answered, rolling down my window to flick the ashes from my smoke out. I shot a glance at the analog clock on the dashboard. 2.45 it read. I let out a small sigh. Great, Vanessa is likely worrying up a storm about us right now. Me, especially. Ever since we'd started dating five years ago, my girlfriend had always been rather apprehensive about my habit of taking long, late-night drives when I couldn't sleep. She always feared I'd get into an accident, either with another car, wrap my Honda around a tree, or hit an animal. Most of the time, I'd come home to find her sitting up waiting for me, worry clearly etched into her beautiful sapphire eyes. I bit my lips slightly. Hey... You think I should text Vanessa and let her know we're okay? I asked Craig. I heard him let out a snort. Honestly, bro? No. I know the woman loves you to death, 
and I'm happy she cares so much, but she's got to learn you know what you're doing. Plus, you two need your space. It's not healthy how much time you two spend together. I flicked the remnants of the cigarette out the window and let out a snort of my own. It's called being in love, dude. You should try it sometime, I joked, causing him to let out a laugh. Nah, thanks. I enjoy being single too much. Shaking my head, I stared out the windshield as the headlights guided our way. I felt a slight sense of unease creep up on me as I watched the two-lane road stretch out before us, the moon in the sky almost completely blocked by the trees over our heads. I hadn't seen another car on the road for two hours at least. Well, what did you expect, Derek? You drove into the boonies, there's only ghost towns out here. Why don't you try driving all the way to Idaho next time? Shaking my thoughts away, I fumbled in the center console for a moment before pulling out a mixtape. A bit of music would help me feel better. I pushed it into the car's cassette player and hit play. A moment later, the pounding bass and sense of dance with the deads that house began blasting from the speakers. Craig let out a whoop of excitement. Dude, yes. That's the kind of tunes we need for a drive like this. He rolled down the passenger window, sticking his head out the window to whoop and holler into the night. I shook my head, unable to keep from grinning at his antics. Friggin' goofball. The playful mood helped settle my mind, and I felt myself relax into the seat, the tension flowing out of my body and out the window. For a few minutes, that's how things went, the road stretching out ahead of us and then disappearing into the blackness behind us, the music blasting out from the radio, and the soft roar of the engine in the background. I shot another look at the backlit clock. Now it read five minutes to three. We should be at the highway in a minute. The thought released the last wisps of tension in my body and fumbled into the back seat for the bag, catching it with the tips of my fingers. I pulled my bottle of soda from it and, holding the bottle to the steering wheel, cracked the cap. I lifted it to my lips and took a swig, taking my eyes off the road for a split second to tilt my head back. I looked back at the road and nearly spit it all out onto the windshield. In the second I'd stopped looking, a figure had stepped out onto the road. Fucking hell! I shouted, jamming my feet on the brake and clutch as hard as I could. The rear wheels of the car locked up, and the ear-piercing sound of squealing tires filled the cabin. To my horror, the tail end of the car began sliding out. Oh, hell, no 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 no. For a few seconds, the world around us became a blur of shapes and colors, and I feared at any moment we'd smash into a tree or begin rolling. Thankfully, the car finally came to a stop with a screech of protest from the suspension. We were facing back the way we'd come, I could tell from the black lines on the road which had once been the rubber of my tires. I gripped the steering wheel with almost a death grip, my heart furiously pounding in my chest. My breaths came in short, ragged gasps. There was no movement in the car for a few seconds before Craig reached forward and snapped the music off. Dude, what the fuck? He shouted at me, his face looking as pale as mine must be. I didn't say a word to him. Instead, I pulled up on the handbrake, ripped off my seatbelt and practically kicked the door open. Stepping out onto the pavement, I stepped to the front of the car on unsteady legs until I was squarely in between the headlight beams. I looked around, first at the road ahead, then at the forest on either side. There was nothing there. What the? I turned and looked behind me, over the roof of the car. The red glow of the taillights illuminated a few feet ahead, but beyond that, nothing but blackness. I turned again, looking out at the darkness beyond the branches. No movement disturbed the bushes and branches, and aside from the quiet hum of the car's engine, it was silent. I shook my head. Did, did I just imagine things? I shook it again. No, I know for a fact I didn't hallucinate. There was someone there. The sound of the car door opening made me turn, seeing Craig step out of the car. Leaving the door open, he immediately came over to me. You have exactly 20 seconds to explain to me what the hell just happened before I lose it, bro, he exclaimed. 
For a second, I fought to find my voice, then I answered. Someone, dude, I'm not crazy. Someone stepped out of the woods and onto the road. It looked like a chick. I thought I was gonna freaking hit her. I realized I'd been holding in a breath and let it out, trying desperately to get myself to relax. Craig gave me a confused look. You serious, man? I nodded. He pulled the flashlight he'd used to look at the map from his pocket and flicked it on, aiming it first at the tree lean on one side of the road, then the other. After doing this a few times, he turned back to me. Well, whoever it was, they're not there anymore, his brow furrowed. But, why would a chick be out here in the middle of nowhere, he muttered, more to himself than me. I still answered. I don't know, man. It's freaking Josephine County. For as many good people live out here, there's also a bunch of weirdos. I heard my friend let out a snort of laughter and reply, but something had caught my attention. A feeling which had slammed into me with all the weight of a Peterbilt. The feeling of eyes boring into the back of my skull. I spun around, looking back towards the car and seeing nothing there. But the feeling remained, and I didn't like it one bit. Especially when the feeling came again, this time from the direction I'd just been facing a moment ago. Realization dawned on me, and I felt a shiver shoot up my spine, along with the flicker of fear. Oh, shit, I whispered. Craig turned to look at me. What? He asked, seeing the look on my face. He repeated. What? I looked up at him, speaking with a bit of a weak voice. Let's get back in the car, right now. He didn't argue, thankfully. He was already moving for the open passenger door, and I matched his pace as the feeling of being watched intensified. As if someone were rapidly approaching from the woods. Oh, hell. I broke, first into a run, then a full-out sprint for the last ten feet, tearing at the door handle and practically launching myself into the driver's seat. Slamming the door closed behind me, I jammed down on the door lock, seeing Craig do the same. He turned to me, his face hidden in the dark, but his voice giving a perfect mental image of it. What the hell was that man? The tone of it gave away the fact he'd felt, even for the briefest of moments, the same feeling of dread and fear I'd had. You remember those videos of people driving on empty roads in the middle of the night, only to have someone step into the road and get them to stop? I asked. A sharp intake of breath came from the passenger seat before he answered, finishing my thought. And then a bunch of people sprang out of the woods trying to ambush them. Oh, hell no. My thoughts exactly. Time to friggin' leave, I released the parking brake, pulling on my seatbelt and jamming the car into first gear. The tires chirped as I hit the gas, and a moment later, we were accelerating away. As we did, the feeling of being watched rapidly fell away to nothing, and I allowed myself to let out a relieved sigh. We drove in silence for another few minutes before I finally spoke again. I think we're in the clear, man Craig let out a soft laugh. Thank fuck for that I nodded, then reached for the soda which had fallen, wedging itself by the parking brake. Snatching it up, I uncapped it and took another swig, the still cool liquid feeling amazing going down my throat. Recapping it and dropping it behind me into the back seat, I let a laugh of my own. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, Craig, but I think after this, I may take a bit of a break from late night drives for a bit. This just got under my skin too much for a few moments, longer than I thought, there was nothing, and then he answered. As much as that sucks, bro, I can understand. No problem at all. I thought I could detect a small tone of sadness in his voice, along with something else I couldn't place, but then I heard him sit up straight. Hey, Jake, he asked, a bit of a concerned tone now etched into it. Yeah? I heard him draw another breath. Shouldn't, shouldn't we be to the highway by now? Or at least see the lights of passing cars? I hadn't been fully concentrating on anything except the next stretch of road in my headlights, but at his words, I jerked my head to look beyond them. What the actual hell? He was right. The lights of cars and trucks flashing by on the freeway should be visible through the dark. 
I clearly remembered looking in my side view mirror as we turned onto the road from the highway, seeing the ever-present white and red glows zipping by both ways at close to the same distance we were now. That wasn't the case anymore. All I could see in front of us was darkness. Darkness and the woods on either side of the road. For a moment, I lifted my foot off the accelerator, letting the car slow down a little as my brain whirred. He's gotta be mistaken, hell, I've gotta be mistaken. We just haven't gotten close enough to the highway yet. You know these old roads, Derek. They often end up longer than they first look. Feeling somewhat relieved by the thought, I said it out loud to Craig. He nodded, but I could tell he wasn't completely convinced. And, for that matter, as much as I repeated it mentally to myself, I couldn't completely convince myself either. It was as if seeing the woman step in the road had shaken me more than I'd first thought. Pushing back down on the gas, I shifted into fourth gear and watched the speedometer flirt with 55 miles an hour. For a few minutes more, neither one of us saw anything as we drove in silence. And then, Craig let out a cry. There. A light. For a moment, a surge of hope welled up inside me, and I craned over the steering wheel, looking to see the highway. It was dashed as I saw it was only a street light, standing solitary guard on the side of the road like a sentry. Beneath it stood an old, worn sign which seemed to have been shot at many times with both BB pellets and actual bullets. I slowed the car some as it came towards us so I could read it, and felt a wave of confusion fall over me. Golden, two miles. The fuck? Craig breathed out as he read the sign. It passed by us, the street light momentarily bathing the interior of the car in light and showing the confused, worried look on his face. How the hell did we end up by Golden? Golden is a ghost town, one which attracts visitors every year to check out the standing buildings. It was a mining town which had a population of a few hundred people, but once the prospects dried up in the early to mid 20th century, it became the ghost town it is today. Its biggest claim to fame nowadays was being featured on Ghost Adventures a few years back. Craig repeated his question, but I wasn't able to answer him. My thoughts were racing inside my head. There's no freaking way, Golden is miles to the north of Placer. There are no roads connecting the two areas, from what I saw on the map. Not to mention, we've been driving in a straight line since leaving the gas station. I honestly don't know man, I finally answered, my voice conveying how rattled I truly was. In the car's dark interior, I saw him put his head in his hands. I fumbled for my pack of cigarettes, pulling another out with slightly unsteady fingers and pushing in the cigarette lighter. A moment later, the turn off for the ghost town flashed by on the right. I saw the dark hulking shape of the church's spire rising out of the dark for a moment. Then it was behind us. The lighter popped out, and I pressed it to the smoke, lighting it and putting it back. I decided I needed to try and calm the rising tension that was filling the car's interior. Look, however we ended up here, man, the fact is, we can't be far now from the highway. So, let's just keep our wits about us, keep calm, and when we get back to my place, you, me, and Vanessa can have a good laugh over this. Sound good? I heard my friend take a deep breath, then let it out in a whoosh. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a plan he let out a soft laugh, and I felt him pat my shoulder. Thanks, Derek. You are seriously a good friend. Glad I've got you, I nodded, then realized he may not be able to see it in the dark. No problem, man, I said. I looked at the clock. 3 a.m., only five minutes had passed since I'd last looked at it. And yet, it felt more like it had been 30. Time seems different when you're stressed. For a few minutes, there was only darkness. And then, a light appeared in the distance. Ha! Ah, there we go! I exclaimed. I waited to see the sign for the on-ramp appear, and felt a shiver shoot up my spine as the sign for Golden flew by again. That's wa. Craig didn't say anything, but I felt him stiffen in the passenger seat, showing he'd seen it as well. 
As the street light and sign disappeared behind us, a feeling began to creep up on me. Another shiver shot up my spine as I realized that it was the same feeling I'd had when we'd gotten out of the car. The feeling of eyes on me. My eyes shifted to the blur of trees on either side of the car, but I saw no one out there. The turnoff for the ghost town approached again. I heard Craig let out another deep breath. Derek, pull over, please, he said simply. His voice was shaking, and as much as I didn't want to stop, I did as he asked, pulling over just before the turn off. He ripped his seatbelt off, shoving the door open and stepping out. I watched him stride to the front of the car and stand there for a minute. He seemed to start shaking a bit, and I realized just how much this was getting to him. I unbuckled my seatbelt and reached for the door handle when I glanced at the clock and froze. The clock was still showing 3 a.m. The hands hadn't moved at all. A feeling of shock washed over me like a wave as I tapped it with my fingers to see if it was merely stuck. But it refused to begin moving again. Okay, what the actual fuck is going on? I whispered to myself. I reached into my pocket, fishing out my phone and turning on the screen. Like the clock, it, too, showed the time as 3 a.m. The feeling of being watched began to intensify, and I glanced at Craig standing in the dark before looking down, beginning to type a text out to Vanessa. Hey, baby girl. Just wanted to let you know that Craig and I are okay. We're trying to get back to the highway, but have gotten a bit turned around out here. Do me a favor, and if I don't text you again in 15 minutes, text me back, okay? I love you. I replaced the phone in my pocket. I knew I should have been more honest, but I was beginning to feel a little freaked out about the weird situation. I didn't want to worry her any more than necessary, as it would make me start to freak out worse. Pushing open the door, I got out and walked around, stopping near the front right headlight. Dude, you alright? I asked him after a moment. He didn't answer, but happily, he seemed to have stopped shaking. I repeated my question. When he didn't answer my second and third calls, I began to feel a new sensation creep up on me. A potent mixture of dread and fear. Craig. Dude, you're creeping me the fuck out. Please say something he finally turned to look at me, and in the semi-glow of the headlights, I saw his face had gone a bit pale. He raised a finger and pointed, saying only a single word. Look. My eyes followed where he had gestured, and I began to feel like someone had dumped a bucket of ice water over my head. The cigarette dangling from my lips fell from my mouth to the ground. Standing about 50 feet away, just inside the tree lean, was a figure. It was drenched in gloom, but with a gasp, I realized it was the same woman who nearly caused me to wreck. Oh, fuck me sideways, man. I swallowed, finding my voice. We should, um... We should get back in the car, Craig, he nodded almost immediately. I think you might be right, he answered, his voice wavering. Not taking our eyes off the figure, we slowly backed up until we reached our respective doors and climbed in. I didn't even bother pulling my seatbelt on. I just jammed the gear shifter into first and floored it. Dirt and gravel kicked out behind us, and the car shot forward onto the road. This time, I didn't let up on the gas. I kept my foot hard down, the engine beginning to roar as I shifted into third and fourth. The speedometer reached 60 as I shifted into fifth gear, the feeling of being watched intensifying with each passing second. I prayed that I would see something, anything ahead of us. An intersection. A house. A freaking out of use payphone, for fuck's sake. And then my blood turned to ice as a light appeared ahead of us. The exact same one as before, with the sign underneath. My eyes flickered to the clock, and terror shot through me as I saw it still was frozen at the same time. This isn't good, bro Craig said from the passenger seat. I agreed with him, but didn't say it out loud. I kept my foot to the floor, the speedometer now hitting 80. The turnoff appeared again. And what I saw made me want to scream. 
the woman had gotten closer to the road. And she wasn't alone anymore. Behind her, I saw others. The outlines of other people. Dozens. Possibly more. They all stood, facing the road. Watching us fly by. And then they disappeared into the rearview mirror. Fuck I breathed out as the light and sign flashed by yet again. This time, the mass of people had gotten even closer to the road. The woman stood in front of them all, and for a split second, the headlights illuminated her. Another flash of ice shot through my veins as I saw the river of blood pouring down the front of her nightgown, one that looked to be decades old. What the hell do we do? Craig asked me, his voice steady, yet filled with fear, the same I felt. I just shook my head. I don't know, man was all I could say. The street light began to appear again when I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket, causing me to nearly slam on the brakes in surprise. I fumbled in my pocket for it, seeing Craig look over at me. I texted Vanessa when we stopped. Told her to reply back in a few minutes. Now, I think I'm gonna tell her to call the cops for something he didn't reply, instead turning to look out the windshield at the approaching light. Flicking my eyes from the phone screen to the road and back, I forced myself to not look at the turn off as we zoomed past the light. I didn't want to see how close those, ghosts, demons, whatever they were, had gotten to the road. I flipped my finger, pushing away the lock screen and tapping on the messenger icon as the light began to appear once more. Vanessa's message automatically opened, and for a moment, relief like I'd never felt surged through me at the small bit of normalcy I had in my grasp. I froze. I didn't even look up at the road. I couldn't. My eyes were locked on the single sentence, reading and rereading it. A wave of confusion passed over me, enough I spoke aloud. The fuck? Craig spoke up. What? What did she say? I didn't answer him. My mind was racing at a million miles an hour, trying to understand. But it was like I was hitting a mental wall. I tried to think of something else as another thought came to me. But again, the same block was coming to me. As it did, a new wave of fear began to rise up in me. One for an entirely new reason than the terrifying loop flying by outside. The speedometer now showed we were doing 90. And then Craig spoke. Can I ask you a question, man? Ice filled every vein in my body. Not at his question, but at his voice. It was different. Gone was the fear and tension he had not even a minute ago. Now, he just sounded flat. No, not flat. I couldn't tell why. But the way his tone was, it almost made me feel like he was smiling. Another shiver cascaded up my spine as I finally forced myself to answer, my mouth dry as cotton. What? He answered as we began to fly under the streetlight. Are you scared? For whatever reason, the question made me turn to look at him just as the light whizzed over us. For a split second, the car's interior became illuminated again. My eyes locked with his. The light flew by. The turnoff appeared again, and for a moment, my eyes flicked up to see that the woman was right next to the road, bathed completely in the headlights. I finally caught a glimpse of her face. And then I was screaming, my fingers tearing at the door handle as the car swerved to the right. I saw a tree flying towards the windshield. I didn't think. I just forced the door open and leapt out. The ground rapidly flew up to meet me. Darkness. I woke up in a hospital room, a bandage covering my head and one arm in a sling. My chest felt like it was on fire as well. The first thing I saw was Vanessa, who, upon seeing me wake up, burst into tears and wrapped her arm around me. A few moments later, the doctor came in. He told me that I was a lucky man, apparently, I'd gotten away with only a gash in my head requiring staples, severely bruised ribs, and a broken arm. Shocking for having dove out of a car at what appeared to be tremendous speed, he said, raising an eyebrow. Then he told me the police wanted to speak to me. He showed them in, and two officers entered, 
asking me many questions. I told them exactly what had happened, well, except for two small details, anyways. They appeared to take my account seriously and promised to look into it. We've had some reports similar to yours, sir, one of them answered tentatively. Then they told me how I'd been found. How a father and son who owned a gas station nearby had been out driving and had come across first my destroyed Honda, which had wrapped itself around a tree and then some, and then, lying unconscious in the grassy ditch, me. They didn't say who they'd been, but I had a fair idea who they'd been. At least, the sun, anyways. That night was three months ago. I've been at home, resting and healing this entire time. It's given me plenty of time to think. Plenty of time to process everything. I try not to think about that night. About any of it. I feel like I'll go insane if I do. Especially after the police told me that they found nobody else at the scene of the wreck. Only the passenger door hanging open. But I've had to, after receiving an email from an unknown address. One claiming to be the son, the kid I saw in the gas station that night. He told me things. Things that his father told him he'd seen for years. That he didn't believe at all. Until that night. When he looked out the door at my car. That's when he'd frantically called his father. As I type this out, I feel myself begin to violently shake. Remembering the woman's face, indeed a ghost, as it flashed in the headlights. The look of horror plastered there as she frantically waved at me to get my attention. The same look the others must have had. Remembering turning to look at Craig as the light flickered over and seeing the smile on his face. A smile wider than any human beings could possibly be, filled with shark-like teeth as black eyes stared hungrily at me, the same shark-like smile the kid told me he'd been flashed as I'd pulled away. But mostly, I remember the single line of text Vanessa sent me. What caused me to rack my brain, trying frantically to recall my friendship with the figure sitting opposite me, and horror filling me as I realized I couldn't think of one single memory. What will keep me from ever taking late night drives again? The three words that will remain burned into my memory forever. Darling, who's Craig? 